now have this kind of developed a hypothesis that it's in fact genetic, that it goes back far beyond the Greek philosophers and writing and so on. Um, so this particular presentation, um, and I must admit that I've kind of fallen in love with alliteration there, so we don't exactly come to last week, but Lucy, of course, was the, or is the uh, Australopithecus afarensis skeleton that was discovered some time ago, and she got her name from the fact that that was their favorite song while they were excavating the site. In the upper left of this is a, a, a sculpture's vision of what Lucy probably looked like. In the lower right is a, is a program. Uh, just these are average. They've taken all the average facial characteristics of some young women, um, either African or Caucasian, and there you go. Uh, so basically, the young lady on the left has no Neanderthal DNA representation. Not germane, but a little sidelight. So what we're looking at here is really modern, what I would call modern human beings, but we're going to go all the way back to the uh, some unpronounceable names there, but. There's a human timeline, uh, which by the way, is constantly being updated, uh, but this gives us an idea of how long this has been. So we're looking roughly um, 10 million years ago, back that far. Uh, we're really gonna start at three and a half million years ago where you see the indication for earliest stone tools. But when we start to talk about humanism, we really have to talk about what I would call modern human beings. So these are post Homo erectus human beings. And they're in listed here in order of their um, extinction date. So Homo sapiens, presumably sometime around 2030, if we keep on the way we're going. Uh, Denisovan, 14 and a half thousand years ago, Neanderthals uh, 40,000 years ago, Flor Floresiensis 50 grand a year ago, years ago, and Luzonensis, I uh, can't pronounce those words, about 50,000 years ago. Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis are in uh, the mauve color because they're, they're going to become more feature in the presentation. Now I have to tell you, that, and I'm sure you can figure this out, that most of what I'm saying here is hypothetical. So to some extent, I'm inviting uh, discussion, I'm inviting uh, concern about some of the evidence, because we really have to look at it, and you notice all the lists there are earliest clothes, earliest bipedal, and so on. That represents there, there being the earliest sites where we've discovered that to be true. So um, there may have been things earlier or not, and there's some couple kind of, I think, astounding differences there or, or trends there. This is sort of the distribution um, of um, mankind. Those, and I didn't mention Heidelbergensis um, there. Um, but that's what basically came out of Africa and along with um, Homo sapiens. Um, over to the right, and right now it, in my screen it's being covered by some people's pictures, but you see that you go right through, straight through to Homo sapiens, which is that sort of light brown line and Neanderthalus there. Um, so a lot of stuff going on there, but we're going to focus tonight on Homo sapiens, our, our own arrogant self name for ourselves, and uh, Neanderthals. Um, so I guess if we're going to look at when humanism begins, we better have some idea of what we mean by humanism or the humanist uh, ideals or philosophies. And I've just quickly put down some of the characteristics of humanism there. Uh, care for one another, care for the weak, cooperative action, community action, skill recognition, and um, resource management and resource sharing. So 
just to differentiate, cooperative action might mean two people working together. Community action might mean a group of people working together for whatever reasons. And so how do we know that those things are, when can we start to identify those things in, in the uh, human history? And we start looking at the earliest things. Uh, for example, in Australopithecus, we see the earliest stone tools. And um, in that, uh, oops, in that, uh, that gives us a sense that that's the earliest time that we can really talk about whatever stone tools mean as a representation of the humanist philosophy. Uh, and same thing with earliest fire use, earliest cooking, and so on. One of the things that strikes me as very strange, I guess, is that you'll note that the earliest fire use seems to be around one and a half million years ago. Earliest cooking isn't until about 750,000 years ago. So we're looking at 750,000 years when they were sitting around fires and it didn't occur to them to hold meat over it and cook it. So I suspect that what we really have there is we, it's just a matter of time till we find earlier examples of cooking to get that closer together. So that's one of the things that we have to be aware of that when we look at this record, it's kind of, um, there could be errors in it. But all those, these watersheds, if you like, uh, the earliest stone tools, earliest fire, earliest cooking and so on, these are all specialty items. And I would suggest that when you look at the earliest stone tools around three million years ago, this shows us that specialty skills were being developed and that there was a shared product around. Well, in my thinking, um, specialty skills mean that someone uh, was recognized as having the ability to make tools better than the rest of the crew and may even have been someone who was a really lousy hunter but could make tools so therefore had a place in the community and that's a kind of humanist um, shared product shared activity recognition that everyone has a value of some kind same thing with earliest fire use around 1.4 million years ago it was obviously since they weren't cooking on it used as a heat source for light and gathering um, place to gather and animals prey tend to stay away from it a little bit and so on so once you've got that, then you're starting to get the basics of rather than just the herd mentality where you kind of group together because that's where the grass is to gathering and fellowship and so on. Um, moving along, earliest cooking, same thing, common fire pits, shared food, the uh, people who were able to share the, whatever they managed to hunt and so on probably survived better as tribes and so on. Uh, earliest clothing. Clothing is a specialty product. Somebody has to figure out how to put it together. Uh, again, it goes to community division of labor. So what I'm, my hypothesis there is that we can look at these things without having any written record and say, those are human activities, human community activities, which are really the basis of the humanist philosophy in terms of day-to-day -day things. So, Going back to that for a minute, when did it happen? Well, it's the earliest evidence we have are the stone tools, the fire use, and the cooking, all things that I think indicate that we're moving beyond the sort of um, tribal evidence of other primates. Um, one of the things we can't do, by the way, is very well compare um, humans or hominids at that point to, say, uh, chimpanzees because we don't know what they were doing at that time. And if you make the mistake of comparing it to modern chimpanzees, then we're forgetting that they have evolved too. So the, what we see as tribalism in a modern chimpanzee may not have been there as much um, during that time frame. So just a little caution there that we, we evolved with apes, but we don't, I don't know, and I'm sure there are people who've done um, paleontological expeditions to try to determine that, but it's tougher to do, I think, because they didn't leave any records. Uh, we don't really have records until we have these stone tools and things to look at. So let's get 
to narrow it down to humanism and Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. And this is before we had the agricultural slash writing revolution. Neanderthals were only with us up to 40,000 years ago. Recent excavations are saying that we joined them in Europe about 47,000 years ago. So in that 7,000 years, we managed to accumulate 4% of D N Neanderthal DNA. So um, it must have been some very interesting Saturday nights in that 7,000 years. Um, at any rate, uh, so, so it takes us 750,000 years to know how to cook and 7,000 years to figure out dating practices with Neanderthal. At any rate, the evidence of cooperative living, certainly there with Neanderthals, the excavations are, they live in communities, they used fire, they cooked, and there's clear evidence of medical treatment. So they had humanist activities, humanist characteristics, just as we do. And if you look at Homo sapiens below it, same list. Um, so really, um, we're, we're really, uh, had they survived until today or, uh, you know, it, it, they would presumably have fitted in quite nicely with our society, um, except of course for our innate racism and discrimination, which, you know, we managed with each other anyway. So then we come along here, the next big development is agriculture. And I really want to emphasize that it's culture here, although I know the word is intended to mean cultivating and whatever. It also meant a really significant shift in culture. Um, land became part of the deal. You precipitated or started to, <clears throat> excuse me, settle down in one place um, and control land, which means that we got the hierarchical controls and those kinds of things. <clears throat> if you read Karis Burkowski's book, uh, Why Men Made God, you discover this is the point at which the matter, the maternal societies become paternal societies. Uh, and in the that equality that existed when be, the before the paternal societies loses out because men now are at home and not out hunting, so they tend to take control of things. But some other things developed about who controls the land. Uh, in some societies that kind of became a moot point in the North American Aboriginal societies. Um, it was a shared resource. They didn't, there was no concept of land ownership, but in the Sumerian area and in what became Western Europe became critical. Uh, sharing, uh, what are the rules of trading? How do, what's fair, what's ethical? All those things came out of this now grow it, surplus trading and so on. Crop specialty, one person learns they can grow one crop better in one area. Um, and then, so there's a lot of trading. And guess what, the minute you get that, there's a need for records. How do you do that? Well, the Sumerians invented numbers and counting. So they could count in some way or other how much of this particular commodity versus that community. And that's, that's a tr tremendous shift. Those, that again is the earliest identification we have of human beings keeping track of quantities. And then of course notation comes along very quickly after that because how do you know who it was you sold or traded that with if you don't, can't write that down? So of course cuneiform writing, hieroglyphs and alphabets come along pretty quickly after that, so we get writing. And that's really a, a tremendous watershed in this whole track, because now, before writing, we could only look at archeological sites and paleoanthropological sites and so on. Now, with writing, uh, ideas become immortal. So we can now look back and see what the philosopher 2,600 years ago thought about or get an idea. Um, and they become, so you can pass ideas down uh, much more precisely. And that's when we start to have the development of the philosophies. And I don't know, it's very hard to identify and you'll notice I haven't talked about religion very much pre-writing or pre 
um, pre-agriculture because it's kind of hard to identify. Even when we start to see burial goods, so you see now defined graves that are obviously intentional graves and goods buried with people. Did they bury that because they had a belief that there was an afterlife or did they bury that just because that was John's favorite knife so she, he should keep it, which has no religion, who knows? We really can't tell for sure and until we get more information, there you go. But once we get writing, we now start to get that division between secular humanism and religious humanism. We're sec we secular humanists say gods are unnecessary. We can go through and be good humanists without gods. Whereas the religious or the faithful say, no, no, you need gods. And that's where the, that, what I call the, the split happens. And it's partly generated by the fact that we can now write things down and very precisely now looking back at it, figure out, okay, that's the point at which we see a differentiation between a secular humanist and a religious humanist. Um, and I know that we're loath to admit that there are humanist characteristics in religions, but there are. Um, so now we're, we're at, we've tightened this down a bit. We're now looking at from Thales to last week. Now, there is a big blind spot in this presentation. I'm not dealing with any of the Eastern philosophies. And of course, they of course have their own track and it's worthy of probably even more study than this. And there was a certain amount of interplay later on but right now I'm, I'm just focusing on western um, secular humanist philosophies and kind of leading um, to our um, our Canadian universe dangerous thing to do in history but time is is short so the first person that I first uh, secular humanist that I think is important to us is a fellow named Thales of Miletus 625 BCE or thereabouts. Uh, and to put him in context, the predominant religion at that point was a thing called mythos. Now, if you remember your grade nine mythology courses, that's what you were studying. You're almost, you could almost say that that was the Greek gospels. The, one of the central tenets of mythos was that gods gave us all knowledge that we couldn't find knowledge for ourselves. Anything the gods wanted us to know, they told us. And you remember the story of Prometheus, who gave us knowledge of fire, according to the mytho mythological religion. And he, of course, the other gods didn't want him to do that, and he was punished, and so on. That's a fairly typical attitude in mythos. Thales said, no, uh, we can learn things for ourselves. But before he said that, he said, you have to be true to yourself. And, and what he meant by that was that rather than just conforming to the local religion, you need to think for yourself. So he was telling people to step outside that belief set and be a critical thinker, really, and start to think for yourself. Um, he was exiled for that. Not that he cared very much because he lived... He was a fairly wealthy entrepreneur. Uh, at one point in his life, he managed to get control of all the um, olive presses. And uh, so he had a monopoly on pressing olives for olive oil and became a very wealthy individual. Um, but he was true to himself, I guess. And he made the statement that we're able to learn for ourselves. Very critical statement because in refutation of mythos, he's saying, Gods are unnecessary. We can learn for ourselves. And he was, did quite a bit of scientific study and so on. Although these are the two most important things that he left us. The next person of interest is Epicurus, and he's about 300 years later. And he founded a place called the Garden. And he did that because he too was exiled, in this case from Athens. But the Garden was the center of philosophy. And apparently women were welcome and treated equally in this garden, something we need to go back to. Um, but he also, of course, was the guy who wrote, generated what we now call the Epicurean philosophy. Another secular humanist, a scientist, 
observation very important to them in the same uh, tradition as Thales and Democritus and some other ones as well. He identified three sources of pleasure, the pleasure of learning, the pleasure of knowing, and all the pleasures of the senses. Now, if I were talking to him, I'd have to ask him why he didn't include the pleasure of charity there because we get a great dopamine response from doing that. But at any rate, he identified these three um, sources. And he also said though, that we need to balance these, that we need to use these in, in moderation. So if you get carried away with the pleasures of the senses, you're not going to be able to benefit from the first two. And we'll, understand, uh, we'll see how that, the church handles that later on. He also wrote the 40 principal doctrines. Um, didn't write that down in one document. It was, he wrote writing the letters and so on and so forth. Most of what we get from him is from his letters to various people. So basically it was 40 principal ideas of how one could live one's life in a positive, caring way without the need for God. One of the first real um, thorough examinations of being good without God, basic humanist characteristic. Um, so he's a very important character. And he, by the way, is influential right down through the Renaissances and so on. Uh, we now jump over to the Romans and I'm just sampling over the years. I can't possibly deal with everyone, but Lucretius, uh, fully named as Titus Lucretius Carus, and he wrote a, a piece called De Rarum Natura, The Nature of Things. It's a 300, or sorry, a three volume work of poetry, which is a scientific treatise, apparently does a, re a pretty good job of describing Brownian motion uh, in dust particles and small particles. But he also spent a lot of it explaining and examining the Epi Epicurean doctrine, the 40 principles and Epicurean ideas. And he became kind of the Roman source of that. And he was an Epicurean. Other Roman philosophers were Stoics, but um, and I don't need want to go into too much into that, the differentiation between the two, except the Epicurean doctrine is that it's, it's possible to have lead a pleasureful, positive life without God. And indeed, according to Epicurus, it's impossible to live a positive life without um, enjoying it and so on. So he, uh, again, first century British, uh, BC, and uh, an amazing, this is a thread that we'll see goes through the rest of the history of secular humanism in the West. Now, this is where we get to what I would call the secular humanist dark ages. The uh, Nicene Council, 325, 327 uh, uh, CE, um, basically the Emperor Constantine, by this time Christianity had started to develop, started at about 100 uh, CE on the Lillian calendar, and immediately you get all these different Christian sects, and they're literally having gang fights in the streets of Rome and they're just and raiding other uh, convoys and whatever. Constantine, and by this time the Roman Empire is starting to sow some cracks around the edges. Constantine thought if he could get them all to read the same book, this would solve the problem. So he took them all and said, you're going to go to Nicaea and you're going to lock yourself in there and you're going to take all these readings, the scriptures that they had, and I want you to, A, translate them into vulgar Latin so that everybody can read this book, and I want you to you know, sort out what it is you can agree on. And so literally the Bible, the Latin Bible, which is the basis of modern Bibles, came into existence and they cherry picked ideas from here and there and argued about it and decided to exclude the Gnostic Gospels and include others and so on. So we had this Latin Bible. Now, of course, we know a, I could spend a whole lecture on the problems with that, but that's what he did. 
Um, now, he also basically uh, said that the Christian religion should be the religion of Rome. And then some people think that he, in fact, made it the, the uh, official state church of Rome. And it wasn't until Emperor Theodosius, Theodosius uh, the Edict of uh, Thessalonica, basically made the Nicene Christian Church the state church of Rome, and particularly the Roman Church. Um, and that's the point at which the Roman, and they chose to call themselves Catholic, meaning universal church, gained power and became what was to be the secular humanist dark ages. Uh, because, of course, they didn't allow any other religions and so on and so forth. Now, the Renaissances, and you'll notice that that's plural. People think there was only one Renaissance. In fact, there were three. And it was through those three Renaissances that the church began to lose power. And this is when we start to see secular humanism have any um, foothold in Europe again. Very much underground from that, the time that the Roman church becomes powerful until we get some of these guys. Charlemagne, the Carolingian Renaissance is the first one. He was the king of the Franks, roughly where France is now. He became the Holy Roman Empire in 800. But one of the things he really insisted on was education, more universal than it had been, certainly not in the way we understand it, but in the way of the nobles. And the stirred, that one of the things they learned was Latin and Greek. Well, now they can read the documents that the Roman Catholic Church didn't really want them to read. The Greek philosophers and, and Latin or Roman philosophers that didn't necessarily agree with the church. So the church's position is weakened. Knowledge and learning is one of the greatest enemies of dogma. The Atonian Renaissance occurs a hundred years or so later after Charlemagne is gone. And this was in Saxony, or what is now part of Germany. And Otto the Great managed to assert the right to appoint bishops. So he defied Rome and appointed his own bishops, which meant that the church bishops were no longer the toadies of Rome. They were under Otto's control. So again, you cracks forming in that monolithic Roman church. And again, education uh, were uh, the greatest enemy of religious dogma is very much promoted. So then a few, number of years later, 12th century, a couple of hundred years later, we get the 12th to 16th century Renaissance, which is one that most of us know about. One of the important things to understand here is that they first went to the Roman philosophers uh, and that's how they started to see humanism and the uh, secular idea of um, being good without God through the Roman philosophers like Lucretius and some others. And of course, through that, through Lucretius to the Greek philosophers, they already knew Latin and Greek, so they could do that. So here are some of the characters, some of the people that were involved in that. You'll notice that they're all Italian. That's where the Renaissance really got going. Uh, Francesco, uh, Francesco, yes, Petrarca, or we commonly call him Petrarch, uh, was the father of Renaissance humanism because he was the person who started to put together these ideas into a humanist philosopher. Now you have to understand philosophy. Now you understand that he is in the Roman Catholic Church. All of these people that we're going to see here are basically, they have to be or they're going to be burned at the stake. But he rediscovered Cicero's letters. Now Cicero was a Roman poet, philosopher in general. Um, one of Cicero's great contributions to, I think, um, well, the art of being a general is the he made this statement that you should never interrupt your enemy when he's doing something stupid. Um, so it's a very, very much a uh, part of uh, that. But he was 
Cicero's letters, of course, were debating. Cicero tended to be a Stoic, but the Stoics weren't great religious people either. Giovanna Boccaccio wrote the Decameron, which is an Italian precursor for um, the uh, Canterbury Tales, used literature to question the church. Cuccio Sal Salutati became the Chancellor of Florence in spite of the fact that he was a skeptic, if you like, within the Roman Catholic Church, questioned a lot of the supremacy and the absolute um, infallibility of the Pope and that kind of thing. Uh, so we, we have the, what we're seeing here is this, this idea that, wait a minute, there are ideas that maybe we don't need this God so much coming in. And finally, this guy, is, this is a critical person to the survival of secular humanism, Poggio Bracciotini, uh, discovered Lucretius de Rarum Natura. Uh, it had been lost, as many documents were, uh, maybe uh, hidden by the church or whatever. But he brought it forward, and this was that link from Renaissance Europe back to uh, Epicurus through Lucretia, Lucretius rather, um, and of course the science in the same thing. So we have a double whammy here with the rediscovery of the science of Devarum Natura and the Epicurean philosophy. Um, the basis for future questions about whether we really need to have a God for, to be ha in order to be healthy and happy, productive human beings. Um, so in other words, wait a minute, Roman Catholic Church, there were ideas before you even existed that are very useful to us as human beings. Now, this presented a problem to the church. You'll notice on his pictures, there's the FR, Fra Poggio, he was a monk. So he was very much a part of the church structure. So now the church has to deal with how do we cope with this new idea that's coming from one of our monks, one of our respected scholars. And one of the ways they did that was to start to criticize the Epicurean philosophy as being a um, a philosophy of excesses of physical pleasure. So they seized on Epicurus' idea that one of the three sources of pleasure were the senses. And of course, we now have that rather insulting term if you're an Epicurean uh, with hedonism and so on and so forth. Um, forgetting that Epicurus said that you have to handle that in balance. Nevertheless, this is, this is a really important discovery because that it is the portal back to Epicurus. Now, we have a lot of in the church people who are humanists. Erasmus of Rotterdam, really a uh, very critical one. He, by the way, is the person who said that in, in um, a man with one eye is the, king, is the ruler of a society of blind men. Uh, so in other words, if you have an advantage, you're, you know, you're, there you go. But he made the mistake maybe of proposing that maybe we should take a look at the history around the gospels. Maybe we should check out the history of the, that the area where the gospels were supposed, the stories of the gospels were supposed to have occurred to check out how historically accurate they are. Well, of course, the church didn't want that. They desperately didn't, and they still don't. They still give Richard Carey a hard time because he questions the historicity of Jesus, and that's really what that's all about. How do we check out how historically accurate those Gospels could have been? And even someone in my position would take a pretty cursory look at it and say, hmm, not much evidence there. Um, Cardinal Basilios Basarion, um, he went, brought back Roman and Greek letters, pre-Christian letters, and brought them into debate in the church and felt that they could be 
uh, useful sources of information. And again, we're now getting information creeping in that the Roman church had tried to suppress from say, well, really from probably from 200 on, but officially from 380 on. Um, he also was very keen on the education of boys. Um, and I think he was, I, I want to put this, to give him the credit, as much credit as possible. Presumably he meant a broad education of young men uh, so that they could study these letters and so on. I mean, I don't know whether, whether he had other interests in boys or not, but one is suspicious. But he actually became Pope Pius II, ultimately. So you see this humanism thing getting right to the top of the Roman church, even though it's not secular humanism per se. The Reformation comes along and believe me, this did no real favor to secular humanists. These are all religious types. Um, Interestingly, William Tyndale was the guy who first translated the English Bible. And he um, got most of it translated before the church caught him and burned him at the stake. Uh, Henry VIII was responsible for the Covedale Bible, uh, which was a translation of the English Bible, which expunged most of the Roman ideas from it. It was the official Bible for Henry VIII and for Elizabeth I. Uh, and then, of course, following that, we got the King James Bible, which is a more balanced version. But nevertheless, all of these, there was, there was certainly humanism among these people. I'm not so sure about John Calvin, but um, they were not, secular humanism was certainly not on. So we're on. So we're still in a kind of dark ages. Although we have lots of people talking about secular humanism and it being a uh, kind of an undercurrent. Uh, we don't have a lot of really a lot of publications about it. And then ultimately it, it really stays that way. Eight, 17th and 18th century. Um, there are a number of certainly philosophers there that are dealing with secular humanist things, but not no real watersheds or changes. They're kind of rehashing the things that happened in the uh, second or the third Renaissance. But this brings us to the 19th century. And the reason that we go here is because this is where we start to see the formation of formal secular humanist societies and organizations. Before that, it was individual philosophers. Um, there were some perhaps pockets in universities, but we're, the ordinary person starting to form um, clubs it's exactly what we're, we're sitting here talking about now. And of course, very major player in this was George Jacob Holyoke, who founded, and it's not on the slide here, but founded the, uh, was one of the founders of the British Secularist Society, uh, and which of course ultimately evolved into the British Humanist Society. He coined the word secularism actually, and secular meaning non-religious or something outside of religion. He didn't like the word atheist. He thought it was too negative. So he didn't ever call himself an atheist. He did later on adopt the word agnostic once Huxley had um, coined it. Um, so he was a skeptic. Um, I think in the time he was critical of the word atheist, people had kind of been interpreted to mean people who said there was no God, which is quite different from what most atheists say now. At any rate, he was one of the great founders of, um, of the secular humanist movement in Great Britain. Thomas Huxley, uh, and as I said, I'm a Huxley and agnostic, so there's a tremendous bias on my part here. In my opinion, he was probably a more important scientist overall than Darwin than was Darwin. <clears throat> I know that's her heretical, but there it is. Um, came from ex the opposite end of the economic scale from Darwin. He was in, in poverty. Um, got scholarships to go to medical school, which he turned down because he wanted to be a biologist. Uh, and he pursued comparative biology 
which was a way of looking at evolution and was in play, by the way, before Darwin, um, and looking at how animals compared to each other. He's the first biologist to clearly state that birds are really just evolved dinosaurs. Uh, now, he thought they came from Archaeopteryx. We now know from DNA they came from the raptor variety. Called himself Darwin's bulldog because he promoted the idea of, of Darwin um, publishing the origin of species. He coined the word agnostic in 1869, didn't invent the philosophy, it had been around for a while, but basically his definition was that it was simply that if you don't have evidence, then you don't know until you find evidence. And he coined that to help his students who were wrestling with Christianity versus science and saying, you know, you have to follow the science and you're agnostic, you can't know until you have evidence. He was also a founding member of the London School Board. He was the first person who introduced biology courses as such in universities, but made a tremendous contribution to the concept of secular humanism with the idea of the agnostic philosophy, where he highlighted that and said, when you talk about, you're talking about knowledge, then you have to have evidence. A different uh, category than talking about belief, where you're talking about theism and, and atheism. So um, it's an, an important aspect in secular humanism. And of course, I'm completely biased toward that. Uh, Charles Watts, interesting guy, uh, founder of the National Society in Great Britain. He came to Toronto in 1883 and be became an early leader of the Canadian secular movement. So he's uh, very important for us because there was a kind of nascent movement there, but he actually put substance to it. He founded a publication called Secular Thought. Uh, and having done that, he left Canada in 1891. But he's, he and his wife were very much uh, part of the roots of Canadian secular humanism. And there's a copy of Secular Thought. Uh, I don't know how clearly you can see it on your screens, but some of the things that are in there um, are, if you look at the page numbers, you can see, uh, looks as though there are uh, 40 pages or so. So it's a fairly uh, substantial little publication. It's a monthly journal. Um, so, there's a, an article on Thomas Paine. There's editorial notes on the natural side of miracles. Um, interesting, in this is the 1909 edition. Somebody published an article saying that Christianity was still a living force in 1909. Imagine that. But they were actually still considered to be a living force. Um, and uh, Jesus is an ideal, which is interesting. So it, in many ways, a lot of the same things that we see being debated uh, in our current journals, um, which is interesting that they're thinking the same way we are, but also interesting to kind of wonder about the progress um, and so on. So some, some interesting things there um, and articles, but he was, uh, this is, this is the, we're looking here at the very roots of Secular Humanism in Canada and the, the movements around that, published in Toronto. Um, I have not been to 183 and a half Queen Street West, but maybe the next time I'm in Toronto, I'll make a pilgrimage and we can uh, start saying our, uh, I don't know, make, making our toasts in the direction of that building or something like that. Of course, that brings us to the 20th century, and this is kind of more familiar territory for us. International humanism and from there, Canadian humanism moving forward. Um, <clears throat> 20th century was a pretty violent century, and as you know, two great wars and, and a whole bunch of, um, a number of serious wars, and the two major ones, one and two, but Spanish Civil War and a whole number of others. Very violent century and the weaponry became much more sophisticated. So the concept of humanism, I think 
in a sense, flourished in that sense in that area because there was a need for it. Uh, so starting with international humanism, we have a group now call themselves Humanist International. They were called the International Humanist and Ethical Union, found, founded in 1952. And they were the people who put together the, the, what we now call, I guess, the humanist principles, where they got together in The Hague and came up with a list of humanist principles to which we could all agree. It was a non-government organization. It has a presence on the, the UN Human Rights Council. Still does, so it's recognized by the UN. It is an umbrella group for 160 national organizations, including Humanist Canada. Uh, now, and they redid the Humanist Principles at their 50, uh, 50th anniversary on 2002. Um, in my opinion, they messed them up because they turned them all into long paragraphs from, from what were used to be succinct statements. They publish a Freedom of Thought report, and I'm pretty sure everyone's familiar with that. And that's the one that identifies how atheists are treated systemically, that is by their government in various countries. And it identifies Canada as rated below the United States in that regard, which is interesting, but it's because they're dealing with the way our constitution deals with us. A very useful document that uh, you should go to their website and get your hands on. Humanism in Canada, again, formalized in 1954. And here's, these are the founders, uh, Dr. R.K. Mishra, uh, Dr. Ernest Poser, Dr. Maria Shutra Khan. Now, I really would have liked to have given you some biography on these people because they're very important in our movement. But if you go to Wikipedia, you'll discover that there isn't a single page or a single bit of information on any one of the three of them. So, we need to do some research and get them up there. Um, because, you know, that's, uh, it seems to me that's a particular Canadian oversight. But we know that they founded the fellowship in 1954, which eventually became the Humanist Association of Canada with Dr. Henry Morgenthau as president and of course, Dr. Buckman as his sidekick. Um, primarily interested in um, the Humanist Canada, the Humanist Association of Canada, uh, really became an advocacy group for reproductive rights in women and so on. That's about the time that Morgan Toller was suddenly realizing that 2,000 women a year were dying from the side effects of illegal and improperly done abortions. And of course, abortions were illegal in Canada at that point at the behest of the Christian churches. Um, because they wanted to control that. Um, and, you know, the non-scientific approach they take to these things. Dr. Morgan Toller did not want to do abortions. He was not particularly an advocate what he was, but he was an advocate for proper medical treatment, particularly women. And he saw that this was a real area of need. Uh, interesting little side story there. I'm not a great, never a great fan of John George Stephenbaker, but if there was ever a man who believed in, in uh, justice, it was J.G. Daffenbaker. And there's a law that's still on the books called the Morgenthaler Law. Um, when Morgenthaler was tried and he was originally acquitted, and then he was retried again uh, on essentially the same charges and incidents. When Daffenbaker discovered that, and he, he hated Morgenthaler, by the way, he, he, he was completely opposed to legalizing abortion. But when he discovered that this had been done to Morgan Toller, he just went ballistic and brought in the law that says you can't be tried in Canada. This is, people think this is always true, it wasn't. You can't be tried in Canada for the same crime based on the same incidents um, because he thought that was grossly unfair. Um, and Henry Morgan Toller was put in jail as a result of that second trial. But um, that's an interesting little sidelight and insight into John George Diefenbaker. Um, kind of a humanist in spite of himself, I think. So, of course, we come up with Humanist, humanist Canada, which was originally founded as Humanist Association of Canada, 68. In 1996, it became the first trainer of officiants in Canada, recognized by the Ontario government, and I think now some others. It's a nexus for humanist organizations. 
and advocates, advocates for separation of church and state. And it has affiliates across Canada. So I don't know whether your organization's affiliated or not. I know they're starting to look at more affiliates. Uh, they don't have that many affiliates across Canada, but I know they're starting to rejuvenate, thinking of rejuvenating that program. And of course, Secular Connection Seculier, uh, founded in 2011 by Barry Webster and Doug Thomas because we felt that Humanist Canada had uh, shackled itself with charitable status. And so the, when you have charitable status, you can't really lobby the government. You can advocate in general, but we thought that we needed to have a group in Canada that was going to actually go after the government to eliminate systemic discrimination. Um, now, I just want to be clear, systemic uh, discrimination is that discrimination that is built into the law. So, for example, uh, Section 319.3b, which I harp on, um, the National Anthem Act, um, even the Charities Directorate regulations are systemic discrimination against non-believers. And we do have advocates in most regions of Canada. We're looking for more. Uh, Richard mentioned that I was an advocate for this area. What advocates do is listen to the community and we get a complaint. For example, I had one a couple of years ago, somebody called or emailed and said, I have a problem. Uh, they have a nativity scene on the public property of the city hall or the township hall. Um, is that legal or should they be doing that? And of course, given that we have the right to freedom from religion, you should not have religious symbols on public property like that. So uh, I said no and I gave him the precedence from the Supreme Court and said, if you give me the contact people, we can write them together, whatever. Uh, so we did. Nothing happened. We got no response whatsoever. So we thought, okay, we're going to have to fight this again. But the next year, there was no nativity scene at the city hall. So sometimes they just quietly do it. They're like, okay, we're in trouble. Because then what happens is they initially say, oh, it's nonsense. And then wiser heads prevail. They consult with their lawyers. And their lawyers say, yeah, you're, they're right. <laughs> and so they remove it. So a lot of it happens very quietly in the background. So this is a little more colorful advertisement. This is the sort of message from your sponsor. Um, basically what Secular Connection does is try to do exactly what Freedom From Religion Foundation does in the United States. We have a different constitution, we have a different society, so it's not quite the same. Uh, we lobby the federal and provincial governments to eliminate laws that discriminate against atheists um, in Canada. Um, for example, the Education Act in Ontario still says that teachers will um, teach uh, basically Christian values in the classroom. We still have the national or theist national anthem played every morning. Uh, we're, I'm now lobbying the Waterloo Regional District School Board to play instrumental versions only until we get those names changed. And it's amazing the backpedaling and, and stuff they do but you just have to be patient so we keep we keep doing that um, we also provide um, a kind of um, nexus if you will as i said with the advocates that people call in and so on and so forth so that kind of gets us to last week i guess and um, so i'm now open for questions um, question and answer session, except I'm an agnostic. So that means it's a question and question session. Other than that. So I'm going to stop sharing now and that'll bring everybody back to life, I assume. There we go. Wonderful. Thank, thank you very much, Doug. That was a, that was a uh, amazing history of that amount of time in such a short period of time. And you brought us right through from Lucy to last week. So at this point, everybody, keep your keep your mutes on. And uh, if you'd like to find the uh, raise hand icon, which is uh, to be found on your participants menu, if you click on participants, it should bring up the non uh, the nonverbal commands, nonverbal responses, and one of those should be a little blue raised hand. 
just like uh, Spencer's got on his, on his icon right now. And so if you find that, if you have a question for Doug, then raise your hand and I'll come to you and uh, you can unmute yourself and ask your question and then Doug can uh, answer it. So Spencer, is that just, uh, you just demonstrating or have you have a question for Doug? No, I have a question. Super. Uh, in keeping with the theme of your presentation, taking us uh, from Lucy to last week is in terms of humanism, it's always a dangerous game to extrapolate. But given that you've been thinking about this for a while, do you see a certain direction in the near future to humanism, maybe, maybe specifically in Canada? Um, I'm tempted to say I wish I could. I, it, it's, I think one of the things that has to happen is that we're, we are going to have to be more uh, assertive in taking our position, you know, as secular humanists. We have to understand that 25% or so of the Canadian population has identified itself as non-believers. That being the case, um, secular humanists make up a pretty small percentage of that. I think if we look at the total number of people who are committed to the group, I think because, and we talked about this briefly, I think before the meeting really got started, that we, we're probably not gonna let go of this social media or computer communication um, facility. And I see a lot more movement in the kinds of social tools like Facebook than I see in the traditional uh, meet in the pub kind of thing going on. Uh, to give you an example, the face, the SoFree Facebook page has something like 384 members. Uh, very few of them post, but they claim to be members. Um, whereas obviously the number of members of SoFree is far below that, the people who are so-called so official members. So I think if there's a, we, we're, we may very well see a more decentralized um, situation. I'm not happy about that because I think it makes it more difficult for us to do things like eliminate systemic discrimination and so on. Um, I, one of the problems with being an advocate for humanism in Canada is that we're far too comfortable here. Uh, we don't have angry fundamentalist Christians in our face the way they do in the States. Uh, Canadians are too polite. And so there's, I don't know, I, I, I'm hoping that the, the, the movement continues and that we develop. It may become decentralized a lot. But, but I hear that it's uh, aspirational rather than intentional, if you know what I mean. Like, um, we don't have that irritant that produces the oyster that they do in the United States because of challenges that they have that the, the vocalization of the religious right uh, to some degree is sort of a victim of success here in Canada that we, it's kind of like the, the anti-vax movement can only take hold in a situation where vaccination has been very successful. And it's been successful for so long we've forgotten why we don't have the diseases that we do today. And as religion, uh, as, as the world becomes more secular, especially the Western world, uh, we become a victim of that success mm -hmm. because we take it for granted. Mm -hmm. It's hard to rile somebody up. It's hard to get them off their couch and get them angry to be activist on a particular issue when we're not inundated with particular issues necessarily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we really, uh, and until you start to talk to members of parliament, until you start to talk to people in our government, you don't really realize how, I want to use the word infected, that may be unkind, but how very much Christianity is embedded in all our institutions. 
and to suggest that we change that, um, and it amazes me that the history of the Canadian national anthem is anything but noble. It's a very um, scattered and shady, you know, from plagiarism to skullduggery to changing for convenience to whatever. But the minute you suggest um, changing that national anthem, one word from all our sons command to all, and it's very, very um, visceral what happens. Uh, conversation with Bardish Chagger, who's the member of parliament for Waterloo and also the uh, minister of youth and development or something now, I've forgotten exactly. Um, but she's, um, by the way, a sympathizer. Um, but I talked to her about the national anthem and she just says, no, we're not touching that <laughs> with a 10 foot mace. We're not going near that. And it's because it is just so, the, the, the religious people are sort of underground. They, I think it, they too are very confident. They don't have to, uh, because they've got it all. I mean, we don't have anything in our, in our whole argument about secular human rights is based on it's one or two lines in a Supreme Court decision about the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in 1984. There's no separation of church and state. So, you know. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, George, you've got a question for Doug? Well, actually, I have some comments more than questions. Uh, the first uh, comment is about the title of the lecture. And I, I, I suppose, uh, Doug, you probably thought about it. Um, I, I suspect that it's very accurate to say that one can, one can detect a history of secular humanism maybe to the uh, ancient Greek philosophers. But going beyond that, I find it, it it's kind of like uh, a stretch to call any human activity to be secular humanism. Like, like we, have to, we have to separate ourselves from uh, interpreting too much and applying too much of what we wish to be to what we find. Uh, I don't think you're going to disagree with me, but that's uh, that's my first comment. Uh, the second comment is that the list of all the names that you have given is very useful, and it's probably very useful for any of us who wants to go and study and kind of figure out what did those do. So you gave us a whole bunch of names that um, to... Uh, to go and check out the Wikipedia, the encyclopedia, who they are and, and what we learned from them. So yes, it was a quick run through a lot of names, but uh, that's uh, very useful. Uh, and my third comment, and uh, then you can reply or comment as you wish, is um, the first part of the lecture uh, seemed very much to mirror uh, what I read recently in uh, Noah, uh, no, what's his name? Noah Yuval Harari's book, Sapiens. And I'm just wondering how, to what extent your uh, description of uh, the history, especially before the Greek philosophers, is based on his, um, uh, on his narrative, or whether it's, so, it's uh, a narrative that, uh, that all historians uh, um, kind of uh, accept. Mm -hmm. So these are my problems. Um, I, I think I, I, I hope I was clear that everything before the Greek philosophers who really can't identify the secular humanism, I'm, what I'm suggesting in the prehistory and the before we get to those is that human activity, the, the very nature of human activity and working with each other is in fact the basis of humanism. Like we're not a, we're not some kind of um, mental philosophy or, or very, very deep thought philosophy. It is just human nature to, that's why we survived as a species. But it, and it indeed entirely hypothetical. Yeah, there's no question I'm um, both uh, Harari and uh, Burkowski, um, I've read both those books and certainly they're definitely an influence. Um, and I really have, I still wonder whether we, and I'm like you, wonder how much can we attribute uh, our humanist concepts 
uh, setting aside secular or non-secular, um, how much can we attribute to just that being human part of it, um, prehistory? And I and I would agree with you. We really, really, really can only start any kind of firm conversation um, with the Greek philosophers, or and, and if we go to the east. Uh, in the Eastern philosophies, then we have to look at Confucius and a lot of other Buddha, a lot of other philosophers, you know, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it is, uh, and the title is, frankly, when I started with that title, my intent with this presentation was to put it out in the public and raise a little hell. Um, and, and hopefully the fact that it's the truth about secular humanism, I have this, I still have this vision that, uh, and I live in Elmira, which is kind of uh, Bible Belt uh, territory. Uh, I've envisioned being in the local library and starting a mini riot with it. So I have aspirations to uh, skullduggery, I guess. <laughs> Excellent. If you can't find the raised hand icon, you can raise your actual hand and I'll come to you with a question if you've got one. Uh, but in the meantime, I can ask a question of my own. Uh, certainly, from, from what I know of the history of, of the of various humanism uh, organisms I, or, or organization, organizations I've been uh, party to in, uh, in, in my time, uh, I know that uh, the, the, the abortion rights movement was a huge inciting moment for humanism in Ontario and in Canada, and that uh, our, uh, our different organizations, humanist organizations, were were inundated with memberships and uh, uh, the growth at that time was astounding and has never been, uh, as far as I know, never been equaled since. Uh, things dropped off a lot since the 80s. I'm wondering if what you, have, have you been searching for kind of another inciting moment of, you know, trying to get people into the national anthem idea or the uh, Ontario separate school issue? Have you been looking for another one of those kind of events where you can actually uh, mobilize and uh, and excite uh, humanists and secularists' uh, interest. Mm -hmm. um, I have and I haven't because I'm leery of becoming just uh, what Churchill said. You know, a solution in search of a problem. That's that's what uh, that's Churchill's definition of Canada. Canada is a solution in search of a problem. Um, and I, you know, so you don't want to do that. I mean, you're involved with Dying with Dignity. Certainly, uh, in fact, I have been, SDS has put in submissions to the um, Ministry of Justice um, regarding the current uh, changes in that law. And we very much want to uh, make parallel presentations to Dying with Dignity and, and, and be a support of that. Um, same thing is true of the separate school issue in Ontario. And um, there's uh, some things come out of the woodwork when you start looking with that. I really was not aware of how thoroughly infected the Liberal Party of Ontario is with Roman Catholic people. OECTA is one of their big financial supporters. Um, and so getting them to deal with um, getting rid of the separate school is going to be a real issue. Um, and that, by the way, uh, constitutionally, they claim that it's guaranteed. It is not. Um, 90, Section 93 says you can carry on with minority school systems if you had them before Confederation. It doesn't say you must. It says nothing whatsoever about funding. So, uh, But the trick, it's another one of those issues to get politicians to deal with that they just back away because the politician is constantly uh, looking for votes. And um, there it is. Um, 319.3b is an issue that we're working with. Uh, that's the section that says it is legal for religious organizations to write hate literature and publish hate speech or publish hate literature and issue hate speech publicly as long as they support their opinion from their gospels or from their texts, religious texts, um, which is something that I'm surprised that the 
Canadian Jewish Congress hasn't picked up on because it gives fundamentalist Christians the right to claim that Jews killed Jesus and therefore are second-rate citizens. Um, so there's a lot of things. Much of what SCS is discovering and is that it's so much of it is local. It's the local council, it's the local school board. Um, when the decision came down in 2015 that opening municipal councils with prayer was unconstitutional, um, I had to deal, there's, there was only one in our region, one township council was still opening with prayers, but there were several others in the area, and I essentially had communication with all of them. And eventually what happens is you, you have a communication with the mayor and they say, no, no, that only one, their common theme was that only, that was a Quebec decision, it's only for Quebec. And I said, you need to consult with your legal reps, speak your legal counsel, because once the Supreme Court of Canada says it, it's for all of Canada. And one by one, they all dropped the prayers and went to a moment of silence because they realized, uh oh, but that's, it's, it's, uh, I think we'd all like to have that cause and as spencer pointed out we don't have that fundamentalist christian force in our face all the time the way dan barker and freedom from religion foundation has um or individuals have in the states uh last i heard they had about thirty thousand members and upwards of five full-time lawyers uh, but they they are um they're very successful by the way and and but again, a lot of a lot of their arguments are local stuff that, that we're finding. Um, so, I think the secular secular nature of Canadian society, and indeed the willingness of religion, many religious people to be fellow travelers and dying with dignity, I think being a perfect example. We don't have the the intense religious opposition to our uh, medically assisted dying um, legislation. Um, I think they've kind of feel, they understand they've kind of lost that major battle. Now with details of having the right to make a decision through a power of attorney and that kind of thing are still on, but, and that's kind of where we're going with it. Okay. Thanks, Doug. I don't want to become a, I don't want to become a solution in search for problems. Fair enough. Charles, you have a question for Doug? Or a comment? You need to unmute yourself, Charles. Yeah, sure. Make it easy. Um, <laughs> I just want to say glad to be here. Point I want to make, service here sucks. And the question I have, um, how does this apply with uh, respect to the whole uh, call to prayer for, for the Muslims and stuff like that, you know, because sort of trying to invade the public space with their thoughts or prayers or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's something we have to be vigilant about, and they are the new, um, we have to be concerned about it. Um, the interesting thing is that school boards have fallen all over themselves to accommodate things like giving them space to pray and all that sort of thing. And so we're sort of now saying to particularly Waterloo Regional District School Board, we want some similar accommodations. And they've, they've kind of got themselves in a corner on that. Um, I spend more time than I care to dealing with Muslim organizations. Um, for some reason, they see me as someone who they can invite to their um, talks or their presentations and that I'm not going to be a nasty person. A lot of the time, they don't realize, like once you've got this Christian or Muslim mindset, you, you often don't see how thoroughly your argument has been destroyed. Um, and I, you know, so I spend quite a bit of time doing that. It is, it's very important. Um, and they're really quite intentionally promoting their, themselves as a part of the community. And one of the things that really frustrates me is, for example, with the COVID-19 thing, a number of television stories, news stories of Muslim communities opening food kitchens and being great 
charity, you know, giving charity to all sort of thing. And when I say to my fellow secular humanists, where are we in this? It's, oh, well, we couldn't ever do that. Well, you can, you know, but you have to be organized. And, and I, you know, Spencer asked about the future uh, or where we're we going with secular humanism. I really despair that we may not be going anywhere. Um, we are so disunited as a group. And the, the assumption, I mean, it, and it's in the charity, charitable regulations. If you become a charity, a church just has to say, we're going to promote our own religion. That's it. Because our society and our laws assume that religions are charitable. They don't have to do anything other than that, and they get charity, charitable status. Now, a lot of them do good charitable things, make no mistake about it, but they don't have to. Whereas when we apply to be for charitable status, and I don't know whether your group is a charity or not, but you have to jump through hoops. You have to come up with at least three charitable purposes that are gonna serve the community. And then every year you have to demonstrate that you've spent money and done things to execute those charitable purposes. Religions don't have to do that. And so, They've got fabulous public relations going on. And frankly, uh, the secular humanist movement, if there is one, has to learn to do that. Um, and, and part of our problem is that we, we, we have a lot of people in the closet. And one of <laughs> people, people say to me, oh, I'm not discriminated against. There's no discrimination against atheists. I don't feel that at all. And I'll say, does your boss know that you're an atheist? Uh, no. Well, does he not know just because it's incidental, it's never come up, or does he not know because you don't want to tell him? And most of the time it's, uh, well, I'd rather not tell him. Well, why? If there's no discrimination, you should have no problem. And yet I know people who have said to me, I didn't get past the three months of, of probation because they said I, was, I did not match the corporate philosophy. In other words, they found out you're an atheist. Now, I'm being a bit paranoid when I say that. That's, that's, I can't, it's hard to substantiate. But really, um, I think we have to be more united. I think that we have to be more prepared to, to, to point out what's going on with the Islamic movement. And of course, you immediately get accused of Islamophobia. Um, and you know some kind of discrimination. We need to point out to people that we consider people who have been taken in by Islam as victims. You know, you you're, or people taken in by any religion as victims, um, because they they are they're not given the opportunity as children to think for themselves or whatever. But yeah, it's a that's a good thing to raise, George, because or Charles rather, because we are uh, very much, um, it's very much a factor. And uh, there was a um, committee, a, a parliamentary committee last year, a year before on systemic discrimination, systemic racism and discrimination against religions, religious and religious discrimination. SCS applied to present to that committee, and here's something you need to know about parliamentary committees, the people on the committee get to decide who presents to them. So guess what? If they're all religion, religious on the committee, they're only gonna to listen to religious people. We didn't get to present uh, 20, I think it was, religious organizations got to present. So this was a very much a committee about how religions were discriminated against, not about how religions discriminate against us. And that's one of, that's, if I have a raison d'etre with SCS, it is to break that down and get to those committees and represent the secular humanist or atheist point of view. Um, I think I'm going to get a hearing on the, the, the MAID committee this summer, um, depending on what happens with COVID-19. 
but I've made a couple of contacts in the Minister of Justice that indicated that they would like to see me there. But anyhow. Great. Thanks, Doug. George, you had another uh, comment or question? Uh, yeah, I have a question, but now. Uh, Doug, I noted that you said that you have participated uh, in several uh, panels with uh, uh, people representing or presenting themselves as representative of the Muslim community. And uh, I've been interested in knowing your experience with, uh, with them. Why am I asking this? Because over the last year and a half, we've had some, I've got, uh, gotten some calls from one fellow who wants to start debates and so on and so forth. and. Uh, uh, we I kind of pushed back on the whole idea of debates, but I said, I don't mind to get to know you people. Now, the, the meeting hasn't happened yet. Uh, I was even talking to this fella just a few days ago, and maybe uh, the whole thing is going to start again uh, after Ramadan. Uh, but I'm wondering, based on your experience, are there uh, do's and don'ts? My, my own feeling is that... Uh, we should, uh, since they they came, uh, they 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 are the ones who asked to uh, us to discuss things with them. I let them um, say, well, what are you interested in? We basically we don't particularly have anything to ask you guys, but what are you interested in? I'm just wondering what you think of that. Okay, most of my experience, by the way, has been with the Ahmadiyya Muslims. I thought so. Um, and um, they, by the way, are not regarded as true Muslims by the rest of the Muslim community. Uh, they are persecuted in Muslim countries just as much as we are. So I've done uh, work with them quite a bit, but I have had some inquiries from other Muslim groups. And um, you, I, th I think one of the things that I would, that we insist on is that if we're going to a meeting with them, then there will be uh, our representation will be at least 50% women. Um, and that sometimes backs some of them off. Uh, they are amazingly chauvinistic, but I just, to my way of thinking, you need to have that uh, feminine ID, idea there. Um, and the other, the other thing is that you, um, debates, our panel discussions work better because you don't have the formality of the debate structure, which they don't understand anyway. Um, so you have uh, a chance to present the second humanist idea. And I challenge them to present proof um, of what they're saying. You do need to have your ducks in order uh, in terms of, now typically what I've been involved with is presentation, oh, it's interesting, you have the Muslim and the, Christian, usually a fundamentalist Christian, and then the atheist. And um, one, one uh, person objected because I thought I was outnumbered. Um, I felt sorry for me. Um, but at any rate, <laughs> that's, um, the, the point is that that, uh, you know, you, you have to be able to set the terms, uh, make sure you understand uh, for example, World Religion Conference, which happens in Waterloo every year, and which we have, SOFRI has participated in for, I don't know, 25 years or more. Uh, and I presented far too many times there. But one of the things we finally came up with a couple of years ago was a, in, in essence, a contract, because what was happening was we, we would get women to present, and they would be treated as second-class citizens. They didn't want them to sit with the men presenters. Uh, they refused to shake their hand. They wanted, and they treated them. And so finally, we just said, here's the deal. Uh, our, our presenters will be treated as equal, whether they're male or female. They will sit where they want to sit. And if that means they want to sit with all the men presenters, they will, uh, and so on. Um, now, the other female religious presenters seem to be OK with this. Uh, we just refused, and they did. They they uh, they cleaned up their act. They changed it. So now they're careful to get the right. Um, they always give you a, a student imam. It's a seven-year program. They always get the student imam to lead you around and and hopefully keep you from whatever. Um, so I know the I know the conference and I know the organization. So I don't go and have lunch with the 
other speakers anyway. I want to get out and meet the crowd. And that makes them very nervous because they can't control me. But, you know, there's, it, you have to figure out what it is they're after. And a lot of the time they're looking for a way to shoot you down to uh, claim, and, and a lot of them are under the mistaken impression that you don't understand the Quran or Christian groups think you don't understand about gospels. Um, so. But Doug, what do you think of the whole strategy that I'm thinking about? I don't even call it a strategy uh, of saying, okay, you're interested, you ask your question and we'll answer, I will tell you about secular humanism, but frankly, we're not interested in what you have to tell us. It's probably impolite, but uh, they are the ones who sought us. And yeah. uh, I feel that I have no obligation to show any interest in, in, in their idea, especially that I'm, I, I think I'm dealing not with Ahmadiyya uh, or Ismaili uh, groups. I'm dealing with uh, a group that I kind of uh, assume to be, well, not assume, I looked at the sites that uh, they uh, uh, refer to and I uh, think of them as, uh, uh, what do you call them? Uh, uh, they uh, ap apologists or uh, uh, they're into apologetics for Islam and so on. They're into Dawah movements. If, if you know what Dawah movements is, it's, equi it's equivalent to missionaries. In yep. their case, I suspect their, their idea of missionary is to, of Dawah is to make sure that uh, the flock stays in and is not affected. So uh, th that's, that's the kind of thing. I don't want to be impolite and saying, well, we're not interested in talking to you at all. They present themselves as we want to get to know the, the humanist community and we are your neighbors and so on and so forth. So uh, I think we should get to know us. Uh, well, I feel like saying, well, I, get, I, I know you and I have enough Muslim friends or ex-Muslim friends. That, the reality, uh, the reality uh, is... The reality is that what they want to do is to find out about your philosophy so they can refute it. I see. They want, they want to um, figure out how they can proselytize. So how do we get to that 25% of the Canadian population are non-believers? That's the reality of what they want. Okay. So you, you to, uh, and, and they will, uh, they, they're not, great logicians, so they will ask you, uh, one of the questions they'll ask is, um, false dichotomies are a favorite. Yeah. They don't know that they're doing them, but so how you either Muhammad is, you either think Muhammad is a prophet or he's a liar. So, <laughs> That what they hope is that you're going to kind of flail about with that and say, well, gee, I can't call him a liar. So what the course, what I've, what you have to do then is disarm their false dichotomy and say, well, that, and tell them that's a false dichotomy. You're giving me two different choices that don't make any sense. He could very well be a, a perfectly sincere person who was misled or misinterpreted or whatever, but just because I don't believe he was the final prophet doesn't mean that I think he was a liar or psychotic or anything else. Um, they want to get you into that corner. So it's mostly for their own, um, you know, to reaffirm their own beliefs. Um, so I, it's, it's kind of up to you. I, it's, it's, uh, you're not going to convert them from Islam. No, no. That's for sure. Yeah. But my, 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 my sense would be, for a question like what you post this false dichotomy, saying, well, uh, there is no evidence for that, and I'm, I'm, I'm willing to ac uh, accept that uh, there, is no e he would, there is no evidence that he is, there's such a thing, uh, not only that he is a prophet, but there's no evidence that there is any such thing as, an, uh, uh, as a prophet. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I'm not in a position to say whether he lied or he didn't lie, and just leave it at that, uh, like total indifference to the yeah. type of question. I mean, I'm not going to go and uh, say, oh, he's a liar, because uh, I'm shooting myself and thought, okay, what's the lie? And then you start kind of going down the proverbial uh, rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, and, and if you get the opportunity, you just have to point out that, uh, and it's a lot easier if you've got, well, for example, I get into a panel discussion with a Christian and a Muslim, 
And they got in with this predictor, Christian was really very high on the idea of the Trinity and thought that was an incredibly important aspect of Christianity. Not all Christians believe in that, by the way. And it, Muslims don't, by the way, accept that divinity, that either the divinity of Jesus or the Trinity. So they got into a debate, uh, very, by the way, very, I have to say, very well-researched, well-done debate based on part A of the gospel saying this and part B of the gospel saying that, uh, each of them taking a different position. And they went on, they, the, the moderator did limit them to, I think, three minutes each or whatever. Two beautiful presentations. And then the moderator said to me, well, do you have anything to say about that? And I said, well, I hope I didn't fall asleep in the middle of that. But did anyone here actually hear any evidence that any either of those two things are true? Um, you know, I, I, we might as well have been sitting here listening to a debate about Hamlet, and whether Hamlet was insane or not. Um, two wonderful presentations from two marvelously educated people, but I'm sorry, did anyone hear any proof for the evidence of Jesus' existence even? And it was, <laughs> it was kind of like, all of a sudden, they were just like, oh. <laughs> so you have to stick to your guns and do what you do, insist on evidence, which they can't provide. Um, I don't, I'm not sure. It, it's kind of one of those things where if you don't do it, you're kind of living, leaving them an open field. But on the other hand, they're, look, they're actually, you have to understand their motive is to gain ammunition. Yeah. yeah. Doug, I, I just, a comment on that, of that aspect. I, I think there might be an idea that they can somehow sort of inoculate their followers from uh, from se uh, secular humanism by hearing uh, someone present those ideas and then be destroyed, destroyed or refuted roundly uh, by their own people. It sort of gives, the, I guess, it the, gives them a lot more confidence to continue to present those ideas and that, that those people over there, they, they talk a good game, but they really don't have anything to offer. They're not logical. They're not, they're, they don't know anything about anything. So there's maybe a, yeah, just ha exposing the, their followers to, to people like us in a minute way as, set of, as a, kind of an inoculation against our ideas. Mm -hmm. um, but I had, a, I had a question, one last question, or question here, and if there's, I don't know, I if there's any more Linda's questions, hand? raise your hands. Did I see Linda's hand up? Yeah, Linda, did you have, a, no, okay. Uh, okay. Well, I had a question for you, Doug, about um, that certainly groups like ours, groups that are, you know, not uh, groups with a huge amount of power in society or or huge amount, huge amount of, um, uh, you know, more minority groups, I suppose, have used identity as a route to more power, to essentially to um, uh, deepen the commitment of their followers to an identity, uh, to, to get an emotion, a passion, a commitment by making the the you know the, the 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 grounds a little more dogmatic and a little more narrow whereas a lot of humanist groups have typically had sort of the big tent idea of of having everyone from um, people who are religious humanists all the way through to the very other end of the spectrum of heavy rationalist free thought uh, you know heavy atheist and putting that all under kind of a rubric of humanism and so, and I was actually criticized at one point by a young person who came to one of the meetings of the Humanist Association of Toronto in our forum where we were specifically talking about humanism as a concept. And she said, I, I don't even know what you people are. You know, you're nothing. You're just, you're everything. And so you're nothing. And I, I found that, that dichotomy difficult to, to deal with because on the one side, we'd want to be relatively non-dogmatic and you know, not give people answers, but give them ideas of a way to think, and then um, uh, and so raising, opening that way way open to be inclusive, but then being countered by this idea of people saying, "Oh, what are you? You seem to be everything and nothing." Um, yeah, a persistent problem, and and I think we at some point again going back to Spencer's "Where are we going?" idea. Um, I personally think that we need we need to make it clear that we are in fact, if we are a secular humanist organization, 
then you need to adopt the principles of secular humanism. You need to agree to them. Now, I would have to say to you that 95% of atheists would agree with them. Um, I mean, if you look at the Soul Free website, we have the seven principles there. I, I don't think there's anybody who could disagree with them. But when you get to the point where you say, okay, are, are you going to accept those secular humanist principles as your guiding principles? They balk. Uh, then, then it's that thin edge of between having common principles and having dogma. Um, but I think ultimately we have to make a decision. I, I mean, CFI Canada has gone, goes through spasms of this every year or two and it splits them. And right now I think their president is pretty much a secular humanist as far as I can tell. But there are a lot of people in that would otherwise be in his organization who are um, almost traditional atheists where they don't have anything to do with religion and the whole, and this is, there is a philosophy or a, a, a tendency for people to feel that what their mission in life is to attack religion and is to, you know, and they, and they get quite excited with themselves when they've taken on a religious person on Facebook and feel that they've won the argument. And um, a few weeks ago, so for, well, BC, um, before COVID, um, Sofri had a movie night with that movie, The Most Hated Woman in America, Madeline O'Hare. And uh, what a number of them got out of that was that being this anti-religious um, militant really did a good, that was a good thing. That really got a lot done. And I pointed out to them, no, that was what, not what did it. Madeleine O'Hare was a very, very skillful lawyer. And all the gains she made in the United States were in the courts. That whole anti-religious stance and all her sensationalism was great as a fundraiser, but did nothing to move the cause forward. So there's no, and I mean, that's, I'm afraid I'm a, a bit dull that way and a bit, a bit boring because I, think that the way to go about solving the problem in Canada is to get to parliamentary committees and talk to them and it takes months and it takes years and whatever. It's terribly unexciting uh, and we don't have billboards. So, but I think ultimately you're right. You, we have to, at some point we have to make this decision and it is a dilemma. Do we want to be secular humanist organizations and say, here we are, you join this organization, you're going to follow these, you're going to say that you agree to follow these principles. Um, maybe some principles more than others. But yeah, that open, it's okay if you're kind of a believer and a spiritualist. With, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, you, 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 this is a, this is a, an, ultimately an atheist organization that, that, has decided that we can be good without gods. Got it. You know? Okay. Well, that's great. I, I don't, if there's no further questions, then I think I, I'd like to take everyone off mute right now. If everyone cut off mute and give uh, Doug a proper round of applause rather than just the visual stuff. So again, <laughs> round of applause. Round of applause. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Just everyone will come to life now. It will come to life. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll thank everyone for attending this evening, and I'll turn it over to George, who's got a couple of announcements for us. All right. I can leave at this point, if you don't mind. Unmute me. Yep, you're muted. Um, folks, before we log off, I have uh, the announcement to members and would-be members. I think most of you are members, but I see some would-be members. Our annual general meeting will be on July 9th. It will also be on. Uh, uh, it will also be on uh, Zoom. Uh, you will soon be getting some information about that. Uh, and uh, however, if you're not a member, uh, or I should I shouldn't say you're not a member. You're a would-be member, maybe. Uh, you should uh, follow us on uh, Facebook or on Meetup, and you'll see the same information. And you're welcome to join. But of course, you cannot vote unless you're a member. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, thanks Bye. for coming, everybody.
and uh, we'll see you next time. We're going to have another one of these, and we'll uh, but obviously maybe not before the AGM, but we'll see you soon. Looking forward to it. Okay. okay. Night, everybody. All right. How the hell do I get a beer here? <laughs> it's well, in your fridge. Or the fridge. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks, Don. Bye, Linda. See you, Charles. Bye. <laughs> Teleportation. <laughs> Bye, William. Night, See you, George. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bill. <laughs>